Hello and welcome, welcome, welcome to today's uh, mobile response and stabilization conversation. Like always, I'm really excited about today's discussion because it's a topic that we talk about all the time. And uh, before we get started, my name is Liz Manley. I am a senior advisor at the Institute for Innovation and Implementation at the University of Maryland. And I'm really happy to be joined today by a very um, a great group of folks who are uh, able to help us sort of think through and, and talk through challenges around implementation of mobile response and stabilization in communities with diversity around rural frontier and uh, certainly urban centers. So uh, we're going to just take a minute, introduce ourselves. Like I said, I'm Liz Manley, a senior advisor for health and behavioral policy. Uh, I'm happy to be your host today. And um, we're just going to take a second and say hello. So today, as always, I'm joined by my uh, partner through a lot of this work, Hazelyn Pilgrim. Uh, Hazelyn, you want to just say hello? Hello, everyone. Greetings from New Jersey. And then uh, Grace is going to join us from Ohio. Grace, do you want to say hello and maybe introduce yourself just real quick, let folks know who you are? Yes. Hello, everyone. Thanks for inviting me today, Liz. I'm Grace Kalisso. I'm the Bureau Chief of Children, Youth, and Families at Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. Thank you, Grace. And then Otoro, do you want to say hello from New Mexico? Hello, everyone. Uh, Arturo Calderon from New Mexico, uh, former acting project director of our Assistance of Care Grant, current wraparound manager here in New Mexico. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, Jerry, do you want to say hello? Good morning. Thank you for having me. I'm Jerry Bachicha. I am the uh, Behavioral Health Project Director for the Systems of Care Grant here in New Mexico. Thank you, Jerry. So before we get started, I just want to let folks know that uh, we'll be happy to take questions. Please introduce yourself in the chat. It's always helpful to know who's here and joining us. And we're really interested in, if you have questions uh, through the course of today's conversation about how do we do or think about the customization of, of uh, crisis services for children, mobile response and stabilization in a way that gets uh, children what they need, uh, but um, really working through some of the challenges of implementation in particular, uh, given geographical challenges. So today's learning objectives really just start with the idea that we're gonna uh, really think about the importance of addressing these ge geographical challenges while we're thinking about implementation. Um, and we really wanna think about the communities that we need to serve, what they look like, what are some of their unique needs, because part of the work is really making sure that we're providing a consistent service across the state so that access to care looks the same for children no matter where they reside. That we're gonna identify strategies to address these geographical challenges in particular uh, to mobile response and stabilization and the need to have uh, really skilled individuals who are gonna help us. We'll talk a little bit about the workforce and then understanding these key strategies around implementation. So really important for us to pay attention to um, what happens in states so that we don't get stuck on how to how do we take the uh, core ideas of what mobile response and stabilization is and, um, and implement in disjointed ways across states? So in order for us to really think through what's necessary, we really just have to stay grounded in some core principles, right? Like what do we make, make sure we want to, uh, that we are really want to make sure that we're paying attention to. And one of them is that every, uh, every youth family uh, will have a consistent quality experience when accessing mobile response and stabilization, right? So no matter where you reside within a state, within a county, whatever you're responsible for, that the uh, experience for families, there will be consistency. There will be consistency around uh, what their experiences is on the call, that first call, in the response, in the assessment process, in the follow-up, in the care plan, all of the components that we talked about. And that the parent and family define the crisis. I we should have put in here that young people actually also can define the crisis uh, for themselves. And so we wanna make sure that it's really clear who is defining that crisis. And that the family and professional partnerships define the response. In other words, we're working together to make sure that uh, we're responding in the way that is consistent with system care values, that prioritizes that the uh, voice of both young adults 
uh, youth and their families, right? That family and professional partners in, are partners in the decision-making consistent with system care values. We're really, this is the beginning part of really level setting the table in which uh, families and professionals come together to um, support a plan for young people. That we're available to all families 24 hours a day, seven days a week, three, 365 days a year, um, regardless of custody or funding or any of those other challenges that might pop in the way. I also just uh, every once in a while want to reiterate that language is really important in this work uh, as we uh, continue to think about how we're going to engage young people, that we talk about children, youth, and young adults, not clients, cases, or consumers, that we're talking about parents and caregivers, not mom and dad, but it's really important for us not to talk about mom and dad, um, that we are really thinking about and working with families, uh, not those families, uh, that we're thinking about treatment and treatment interventions, not placement. Pl placement's really important in this particular conversation. Um, that we're engaging and, and uh, we're working to engage young people. Um, the idea that 15 year olds are not motivated really is kind of the way it's designed. I mean, 15 year olds generally are not really motivated for some things. And so we wanna make sure that the system is organized in a way that is really about engagement for young people and their families and is really open uh, to what families are calling for, what young people uh, might be needing. And that we transition, uh, that we don't close or terminate. Uh, I know Hazel has heard me probably say this a thousand times that we don't terminate, <laughs> terminating 13 year olds is just too much for me to bear. I can't even think about that, right? And that we uh, think about missing uh, young people who are missing. This is really important, I think, as we uh, talk about and uh, think about uh, 988, 988 implementation, as we think about um, really access across the board, that we think about young people who are not where we think they should be, that our job is to go find them, bring them back and find out why they were missing in the first place. And this idea of running away really is important for us to move away from because it's not really helpful in ensuring that young people get what they need. Uh, so real important in terms of language. Okay, let's just talk so briefly about some quick strategies, some ideas or thoughts about how do we uh, address um, some of the real um, uh, geographical uh, challenges that we have. And so first of all, uh, and some folks who may have heard me speak before know that I was the assistant commissioner in New Jersey's children's system of care. And you're probably thinking, what kind of geographical challenges do you have in a state like New Jersey where you can drive through it pretty quickly? Um, so I'll just give you a couple. One is that uh, New Jersey, although a small state has a lot of people in it, sometimes getting from one part of a town to the other can be really uh, challenging. So we don't wanna just uh, think about uh, rural communities um, having challenges. We wanna think about urban centers and other parts of your state. So when you think about it, and when I was the assistant commissioner and had to think about how we were gonna ensure that individuals get where they're supposed to be at the time they, we need them to be there, we had to think about all parts of the state not just one part or another, not just focusing on, and I have worked in the most rural parts of New Jersey, which some folks think is not true that there aren't rural ports. But um, as I said to some folks yesterday, I, I have driven in New Jersey for an hour and a half without seeing one gas station, one Dunkin' Donuts, or, or uh, any other uh, things that look like civilization. So uh, there are rural parts or places in New Jersey that we need to worry about. Now, some of you are thinking, we would drive for five hours or eight hours and not see anything, and we can appreciate that. But what my point to you is that we need to understand the uniqueness of the communities that we are serving, understand what those needs are for each of the communities, and figure out how we're going to address those challenges. So for, for um, as we think about this, right, we want to develop and implement communication strategies that make sure that people know when and how to access care and what that looks like, right? So we want to make sure we have a, a consistent message. And by the way, that messaging might look different in some communities rather than in others. In some places, in more urban centers, we might be able to do a communication strategy that looks different and feels different. And as a quick example, when I did some work in a more rural parts of New Jersey, there were some grassroots organizations that we knew had the, they, they had the ear of the majority of the communities within uh, the county that we were serving. And so 
we really made sure that we develop really important relationships with those individuals. So it's just really important to know who you're serving, what those communities look like. Now we are gonna talk about the use of technology as a tool, but not as the end all be all, right? So in other words, we don't want mobile response and stabilization to only be telehealth technology, right? We wanna actually venture into the world in which we're gonna be able to enter that child's home at some point. But that telehealth technology, that technology piece might be helpful in bridging the gap to making sure that we're connecting as quickly as possible and that we're gonna train some, some individuals to do this work who are gonna ensure that they can engage in ways that are really important. What we've learned from COVID is that not all families are responsible, are responsive to uh, technology, not just because they don't have access, but because it's not, an, for some folks, it's just not an engaging tool. Um, so it's important for us to think about um, the use of technology when and how, because in ensuring that we're engaging and being in, and really working with families to be engaged right up front is an important component of our, our philosophy of mobile response and stabilization. That we're thinking about strategic partners. And when we think about that, knowing and understanding ins and outs of your communities is just really important. And so some strategies that we've heard about from folks across the country include partnerships with uh, local community centers, with other organizations where they outpost staff, where they, um, uh, and as a quick example, in one of the communities in New Jersey, mobile response and stabilization uh, staff outposted to the family support organization uh, when they needed a place to stay or to be, right? And so looking at local partners and where can we make sure that staff are available, that we can have them uh, be in, in proximity to where they might be served. One of the really important parts of that is understanding the demographics within the communities, understanding the populations that you're trying to get to, how many young people are there, how often do they use these services, what do the schools know, how do they know how to access care, how do we partner with those schools in a way that is meaningful, or all parts of this conversation when it comes to the challenges around addressing the needs of children, youth, and families from a, a, in the geographical challenges that, that happen across the country. We also want to talk about staffing patterns and when, I mean, the interesting thing about mobile uh, response and stabilization from the states that have been in this work for a while, and this got a little bit off track during COVID, it seems to be moving back on track uh, in terms of the data is that um, but when schools close, calls go down, right? That that's just naturally what happens. And so, you know, recognizing the patterns of when and how mobile response is used is really important. Um, now, this might have you thinking that 24 seven isn't so important. I'm just gonna argue that it's really important because it's a game changer for families who um, when they call and they ask for help and help comes, it is really important game changer. Uh, when families call and ask for help and help does not come, it will change the perspective of that family, not just for this experience, but through the course of their experience moving forward. And so we really wanna think through when 24 hours, seven days a week, 365 days is not possible, then we really wanna make sure that we have a communication strategy to make sure families know and understand what that's about and what our game plan is for moving uh, that needle. And then we really wanna engage uh, informal supports in these conversations and we're gonna talk about that as we move forward. So just some, uh, some really important strategies to think about. Uh, before I move on, I also wanted to add one more uh, important strategy and that is we want to make sure not only do we understand the demographics of the communities that we're serving and that we're communicating well within the communities that we're serving, but that we're touching with all of our child serving systems, right? So that we're engaging our child welfare partners, our juvenile justice partners, that our education partners, that the pediatricians and that the um, uh, family practitioners all of these partners are part of our ongoing conversation at our table so that we understand what's happening, how it's happening. We wanna make sure that intellectual and developmental disability population um, and those who are responsible are communicating with us so that we understand not just the geographical challenges uh, for implementation, but sometimes the system level implementation challenges 
that might be happening as well. So that's, uh, that's uh, my quick overview on some of these uh, both challenges and some ideas uh, for uh, things to think about. I'd like to take a, a minute and hand over to Hazel and Pilgrim, uh, who I know has a bit more to say in particular about the family uh, and young people, uh, their voices within this conversation. Take it away, Hazel. Thank you so much, Liz. Always uh, good to be with you all and to have this opportunity to share and to learn. Um, as I was thinking about today's topic, I, I reflected on the role of peers as I run a family support organization, which provides one-to-one -one peer support to families, to caregivers. And I think in my experience, it is most helpful and most effective to include peers at the beginning and also at the point of transition or follow-up. What do I mean by that? Oftentimes we get phone calls from schools or from other agencies, maybe from parents in the community who are struggling. And we can we end up being the first point of contact to connect them to the uh, contracted system administrator who then will dispatch mobile response if is necessary. Uh, I recall one situation with a parent who got our number somehow and called from a train station, you know, saying my kid is at, and I don't know what to do and we connected them. Um, but then what happens after that? We are not licensed professionals. We are unlicensed peer support providers. But what we do have is the lived experience that can help bring calm to another parent who's in crisis and help them actually navigate the services. So that's the beginning part. The middle part is after that parent has gone to crisis, they've had somebody come out to um, support them, to provide services for an, for an interim period. They need still to be connected to others after that experience. So that's where we come in again and we can offer one-on-one -on -one peer support in the form of wellness calls through our warm line, in the form of uh, support groups where they can come together, the parents can meet other parents who are going through certain similarities and uh, begin to form a community. And lastly, after the child has completed their course of care with mobile response and stabilization services, that family can remain involved and remain connected through our warm line and support groups. And most importantly, we hope that we have connected them to other partners in the community that further that stabilization, that sort of seal the deal so that we don't see them necessarily escalating to the higher levels of care, going back through the system, going to the emergency rooms or having um, unnecessary and undesirable contact with law enforcement. So those community partnerships that Liz alluded to are critically important. We spend a great deal of our time talking with fo folks in school systems. We also have some outreach to the faith-based community where people go when they are distressed. Uh, we also have outreach to um, the local mental health providers, uh, intensive family support services and so on. Depending upon the age of the youth who's involved, that may be an appropriate referral. And so we collaborate with those referrals. And just today we were going through uh, and vetting some of the resources to make sure that they're valid because that's important to families when they're in crisis. They don't have time to do the research. So we can be that as peer support providers. Uh, we can provide that for them. I, I think typically peer support providers, we call them family partners, have strong engagement skills and empathy. And they know how to provide support during, uh, to parents during a, an emergency situation because they've been through it themselves. And one of the things that is important for us is to have ongoing training from a workforce development standpoint, ongoing training and solid supervision. In our case, supervision not only takes place one-to-one -one in terms of the administrative supervision, but we have supervision around how is this affecting you? What are you learning? What are some of the strategies that you're finding helpful? What are some of the needs parents are expressing about the system and what's working? 
So we have group and individual supervision. And that's, that's really important to make sure that we practice in a way that is true to wrap around values and principles and, and so somewhat um, consistent across the board. Um, one other point that Liz made was about the idea of outpost. And some time ago, we, we played with that idea. I think it's a brilliant strategy. And while we may not be physically in the same space, there are a number of organizations in our immediate environment, such as probation um, that we've connected with. And sometimes the probation officers will bring someone down and say, can you connect this family? Uh, so having those connections in the community and those outposts where if you're in a place where there's opportunity to collaborate, that they have your information and you have theirs, and that can be a resource to families. Informal supports, reaching out to um, educate the school systems, the parent groups, even online communities that are very popular now, I find to be a great way to help families stay connected. And I think that's about it for me today. Sorry about that, Hazel. No, no. Hey, listen, I think they're all really terrific points that you're sharing. And I think the idea of um, all of the other connects and the tools are really, really important. So mm -hmm. they, thank you for doing uh, that, that mm -hmm. overview. I appreciate it. Before we move to Grace, I just wanted to, um, and we will move to Ohio, just to sort of set the stage a little bit for um, Ohio real quick in that we're very happy that we have uh, both Ohio and New Mexico here today because they're in different phases of implementation and really thinking about this work um, very uh, similarly and they wanna to get to statewide implementation. But I think they have a lot to share around uh, some of both the challenges and opportunities. So I just wanted to say, we're really, really excited about both uh, the work in Ohio and in, in New Mexico. So Grace, I set the stage for you just a little bit, but we're really happy that you're here. Thank you, Liz. Once again, thank you for having me here for this conversation this afternoon. Next slide, please. And so last month, I think most of us saw uh, the uh, national guidelines from SAMHSA on the youth and uh, child behavior health crisis. And I just took this quote out of there because this is apropos to us doing the mobile response and stabilization that we all are doing and learning about. Next slide. Next slide. And so just to tell you a little bit about Ohio, demographics about Ohio. Ohio is in the Midwest. It is the 34th largest uh, state, uh, the seventh most populated, almost 12 million people. And out of that 12 million people, we have over 3 million uh, children and youth, zero to 20. And Ohio has 88 counties and is both of rural, Appalachia, and urban. And mm -hmm. it is uh, a local administration state. So you can just imagine uh, geographical challenges as well. Mm -hmm. Next slide. And so Ohio has a unique opportunity for children's behavior health services uh, currently. Our current uh, uh, governor from his uh, initial uh, administration from the day he got into office, one of his first act was to create uh, a, a office of children initiated. And it's a cabinet level office with the aim to coordinate and align uh, children's programming and also advanced policy for children programming. The governor has had a unique priority uh, for children and his uh, effort has really gone towards that in making sure that children that were placed out of state return to the state. And a lot of effort has been done as I was discussed this afternoon. Next slide. And also that is echoed with uh, by our director who says that our crisis services, of course, you address the need of the children in the community to make sure that we have children remain in the community, to make sure that we work collaboratively, that our strategies are off screen and we provide those services to families prior to 
the crisis occurring or immediately thereafter to make, make sure that we give those services at a critical point for the overall continuum of care for that uh, child, youth, and young adult. Next slide. And so I mentioned earlier that the governor really charged uh, uh, state departments to make sure that children return from out of state placement. Ohio had a lot of state uh, children out of state. And so hence a new uh, generation of Medicaid forming uh, children's behavior health service called Ohio RISE, which is Ohio resilience through integrated systems and excellence. And as uniquely look at some of the services, I would just point out some of the services that are new and some of the services that were enhanced. Uh, we have a new uh, 1915 behavior, uh, service waiver. We also have a new moderate and intensive care coordination, as well as we have enhanced intensive coordination. And of course, we will be having a new uh, PRTF. Uh, but in the middle of that is the new mobile response and stabilization as a Medicaid service. Next slide. And Ohio Rise, just summarizing some of the objectives of Ohio Rise to make sure that children remain in, in their own home, in their own community, to make sure that parents do not have to relinquish custody to obtain behavioral health services for their for their children that are experiencing multi-system and to make sure that family and youth voices are the center of all of that, as well as stakeholder engagement and transparency. And then of course, share governance by all uh, departments as well. So our mobile response, next slide, and stabilization started uh, in 2018 with our system of care, just to uh, level set what Mobile Respond is all about. Uh, it started in 2018 with our system of care grant. We applied for that grant and uh, that was to expand our wraparound services, but to also pilot mobile response and stabilization. So we visited New Jersey. We had consultation from Connecticut, just to make sure where it all started in New Jersey uh, and to get some understanding of the, to observe and have consultation with Liz has been working with us throughout. And so we piloted mobile response uh, within 13 counties in 2018 with our system of care uh, grant. Next slide. We just like to make sure we uh, highlight the core tenants when we're training, when we're training uh, on mobile response to make sure that it is a 24, uh, seven days a week, 365 days. And of course, if family defines the crisis, uh, and then of course the initial stage is to meet the family where the crisis occur, to deescalate this crisis, and within 70, 72 hours to make sure there's a safety planning with the family as well. And then for Ohio, it is the stabilization phase is between four to six weeks. And then if the family need more services, it is transition to other services. However, within that time frame is to make sure that families coach, train and mentor to new services to avert, avoid those crises or to, to be able to learn those skills to deal with the crisis when it reoccurs. Next slide. And so in 2018, our uh, mobile response were in these counties, uh, 13 counties, and we work with those counties. They're mostly uh, 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 Appalachia counties as well as rural counties. We didn't have a large metropolitan county, which is, of course, this uh, capital city, Columbus, uh, Cincinnati, or uh, Cleveland. We didn't have any of those uh, at that point in time. But we really look at these counties being ready with the readiness of really highly trained uh, wrapping around coordinators in within those counties uh, with other services that the counties are ready to uh, uh, implement and pilot our mobile response. Next slide. And so part of building that infrastructure is to make sure that we had the leadership and we had training in education, uh, introducing a new service, especially if it's a service that is going to be uh, seven days a week uh, within 60 minutes, of response time, you need a lot of support, you need a lot of uh, uh, training. And so we really collaborated with the, the local boards to make sure that we were working together, we were understanding what it is we were planning to do and to really train and educate on mobile response. When we took the trip to New Jersey, we also took uh, some board members with us as well to make sure that they saw what was happening in New Jersey. Next slide. Uh, and so, 
developing a mobile response to go statewide, we had to develop the rules, the higher administrative code, to make sure things were in, in, in rule. Uh, we also develop a standard practice. The standards are make sure that uh, people were practicing the same way and making sure no one was just deciding what mobile response looked like, but we wanted to make sure that the model, the standard of the model were practiced. We also had to establish bench benchmarks to make sure that where, where do you want to be at a certain time? We wanted to make a standard benchmark for all our providers to make sure within the time frame of response, within the time frame of safety planning, that the uh, team composition consisted of peer, both uh, parent peer as well as youth peer, uh, to make sure all of those things were benchmarked to see where we and how are we practicing. And of course, Ohio went further to develop also uh, Fidelity tool, which we are now using for statewide uh, uh, implementation. Next slide. Part of that is to also make sure we had a point of access, a, a single call line. And so Ohio instituted a single call line and here's our, our, our number listed there. We are really uh, marketing that number. We realized after the pilot, most of our families are still calling the providers. And so it's taking some time. We just launched this in uh, July when Ohio Rise went live. And so it, it would take some time to get used to, but our referrals are really increasing. And so this number is central line. We also build our data management system within that. So our providers are putting their data in there. The call is being tracked and then linking and really uh, handing off to the providers and then when they make that contact, they are putting in their uh, safety planning as well. And we're tracking all of that. All our benchmarks are also in the data management system that they can go ahead and see where they are, pull reports as well. And so it took some time to be able to establish a central line uh, as well as our data management system. And that was launched in August after mobile response went live. Next slide. We also had to create, uh, the state created a child adolescent behavior health center of excellence. And that was awarded to Case Western University. In that way, all our training was centralized, all our learning communities were centralized, or our technical assistance was centralized. So uh, state, sister states got together and said, we need a center of excellence. And so we went ahead and did a competitive RFP and it was awarded to Case Western University. Next slide. So Case, of course, is doing all our training and professional development for all our providers of MRSS. Uh, so building service capacity. One of the things that we did before we went statewide was to give infrastructure dollars. And so our sister agency combined funds and were able to give providers who were interested in establishing MRSS to build infrastructure, to have the time to train, to have the time to hire, and to have the time to also be able to do your contract with your providers as well. We started off with the boards when we did the pilot, but then we went ahead as providers uh, also to be able to have a, a, a linkage within that our boards, our mental health boards are the behavior health authority within the county. And so we wanted that relationship to be established with providers. And so that part of that was also to give the money to the boards and have our providers established and build infrastructure before uh, implementing MRSS. They also do service implementation support, uh, the fidelity monitoring to make sure that our uh, providers are practicing to fidelity and of course, quality assurance and evaluation as well. So all, all of this is done by our Center of Excellence. Our Center of Excellence is also doing FFPSA as well as providing that training as well. Next slide. And so for conditions of su uh, uh, success within the state in implementing MRSS and going statewide, it takes a lot of work, but if the success came from our state leadership. I mentioned earlier, our governor has made children a priority and behavior health a priority within the state. And so he is not stopping at anything and making sure that families have access to services, that multi-system youth have services. Um, and so part of that came from his leadership, as well as our department leadership, as our sister agencies as well, child serving agency, uh, Department of Youth Services, Medicaid, everyone 
knowing that this is a priority of the governor. We all sat at a table in creating some of the services, in creating the rules and so forth. We also had the passion and ownership of stakeholders. I think when we started the pilot at first, it was a lot of pushback, but as providers began to do this service and really implement MRSs, there was a passion for it. There was really, we have to do this. And so it was a, a little easier when we said we were going statewide and MRSs became a statewide uh, service uh, um, instead of just piloting it uh, 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 within few counties. And there was the political will, the governor and everyone else saying, this is the thing to do for our families and youth. Um, and our stakeholders uh, also were at the table uh, when the rules were being written, of course, to get our feedback. And you know there were a lot of discussion. I saw this will work, this won't work. How can you consider this? And so we also negotiated with them, working with them and made sure we were collaborating on the rules and the standards as well. Next slide. And so as we went from 2018 to now 2022, uh, MISS is not a Medicaid billable service uh, within five years. And now it is from 13 counties. We have about 33 counties now. Uh, some of those, the dark green right now are the ones implementing MISS. The lighter green is actually, uh, they are certified, but they're waiting on workforce. Uh, to really implement MISS 24-7. Uh, and so some of our providers have said, you know, the first of the year we with a workforce shortage, we're really trying to hire people. But we have all of these counties now certified as MISS uh, services within those counties. Next slide. And so part of what we learned uh, implementing MISS coming from a pilot program to now a statewide program uh, that the tasks were not easy, but we needed to start where we were to build from where we were. So we envisioned to do MISS. We went for consultation, national consultation. Uh, Connecticut is consulting with us. Of course, New Jersey consulting with us to make sure that we understood what it is we were doing. Mm -hmm. And so we started from there and we went on doing a pilot we didn't immediately go statewide, but we started with a pilot within a few counties that were ready for this service, trying to explain, educate on what the service was all about. Um, we know there was a need there because we saw the data that, that showed us that our children and youth were out of place, out of home. The juvenile uh, detention rate were high. Our children's services removal rate out of home. And so we know this, we knew that the service was needed. We just needed to make sure that we implemented it the way we thought it should be. And so to build a sustainable infrastructure, to make sure that when you build it, that it would be funded. We had no idea this would be a Medicaid service. It was our dream and hope to do that. But when we build this service, we build it in such a way that when Medicaid heard the success and how well it was going, that this service was needed within the state. And so that's the infrastructure and sustainability that was built within uh, uh, the state for mobile response. We leveraged. There was a lot of um, collaboration, pushback, but yeah, we were leveraged. We leveraged and we could come to the table and talk about it and be able to say, okay, we agree uh, to disagree sometimes. All we were explaining, the state was explaining to our providers. So instead, we explained to the county, this is where we are and this is why uh, this is happening. Uh, there would be a disruption of the status quo when you bring in a new service within especially a service that centers families' voice and they define the crisis. It is a new new status, uh, a status quo that we buck in the status quo because we all want to define when families call, we said that's the crisis when we have to listen to the family. And so part of that was to disrupt that status quo as well. Changing policy, I mentioned that we had to develop the rules and the standards as well. And of course, some of the recommendations uh, that we were able to get from our family, recognize that there would be challenges along the way. And to uh, we will grow through this. This is a new service that we all will be growing and learning from as well. Next slide. And so without anything, uh, it is always a challenge when uh, there's a new service, when there's any service, more or less if it's a new service. Uh, it's a cultural shift. 
for how we do business and how we work with children and families uh, where crisis are concerned. Most often we look at adult crisis and not children's crisis services. And so this is a new service. And so we have to look at the portrait shift as well. Um, so it is also a uh, behavioral health workforce. When you introduce a 24 seven uh, service with interstate and you have shortage of workforce, that can be challenging as well. But we're looking at system transformation. And so now we also have a, a peer, uh, Hislin talk about peer and the work they do. We have a peer certification track as well. And so while we were doing parallel developing the rules for mobile response and stabilization, we were also developing the rules for our peer young adults uh, certification. So we had adult certification before, now we have family and youth uh, a certification track within the state as well. And so using that as composition of the team. And so we're leveraging that opportunity to appear on the team as well, uh, as well as family on the team as well. Um, we will be stretched, you know, providers will be stretched. And so we should be open to know that we just have to pivot when time comes, you know, just how we pivot quickly when COVID came and we had to pivot to telehealth. We know we have to pivot when challenges come along when we are doing such a service. Uh, and so we know the opportunity is there. We'll create uh, opportunity to pivot and share accountability and responsibility and just transform uh, in what we need to do. Of course, the city funds, currently uh, we were able to uh, work with sister agencies to be able to pay for those non-billable services. We wanna make sure that we're able to sustain that because for a new service, you know, uh, there will be times that uh, the funds will be depleted. And then we want to make sure that we sustain that and sustain the services for our families within the community as well. Next slide. All right. I would now turn it over to my colleagues from New. Oh, I'm sorry. Before you do, Grace, there's okay. a question I just want to make sure we get to and don't, we don't lose track of. There was okay. a a question in the chat is, what is your certification process? What is it? The cert what is your certification process? The certification process for MISS or for PEER? Uh, let's talk about mobile and then if you want to connect the dots. Okay. 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 So and for the certification, it is the rules are there. And it, uh, if you have five for generalized services, right? So we have the rules developed where you have those generalized services that you provide behavior health services counseling and you have all of those within that as well as the team composition uh, i can send the, the link of the rules to to people if they are interested at least i can send it to you yeah um, that, would be, that would be great yeah and so all of that and then you would then apply for an interim certification uh for about uh 18 months uh, mm -hmm. twice. And then, of course, you can go for full certification once you have your fidelity review and you pass your fidelity review. So it's similar to, to the work that you're doing around high fidelity wraparound. Correct. Right, right. It, for, for folks who are listening, they're very similar processes, right, is around this idea of certification around what it, what it kind of looks like. And what's important is both mobile response and stabilization and intensive care coordination using high fidelity wraparound are foundational elements of systems reform, right? They are not just service. If we only think about them from a perspective of a service delivery, like an in-home service or outpatient care, we miss opportunities for systems transformation, right? And the third part of that leg, of the way I like to think about it, that three-legged stool is is the role of parent peer support, but even bigger than that, that family support work that gets done in a larger, you know, systems reform way. So I just wanted to put that out there for the group who's listening as well, that, that, that mobile response and stabilization is not just a crisis service. It is, uh, it's designed as a, um, truly as a, a way of doing transformation within uh, children's behavioral health, or as the way that we like to think about it, building a good and modern system. Yeah. Thank you, Grace. Okay, yeah, I send that rule. I send it to you, Liz. Thank you very much. All right, Atoro, you're up. Thank you, Liz. 
Well, we are definitely at a different phase and a different stage here in New Mexico in the uh, in regards to developing a children's uh, mobile response and civilization service. Uh, we received the SAMHSA grant, the Assistance Social Care SAMHSA grant in 2019. Among some of the deliverables of the grant, we had the uh, expansion of wraparound, expansion of uh, family peer support, uh, respite services, and the development of uh, children's uh, MRSS. And so as a grant deliverable, uh, kind of going through the stages, if you will, of developing a new process of introducing a new service, I think we've moved from the pre-planning phase. And the pre-planning phase really had to do with understanding what exactly is children's mobile response. Um, I think prior to that, uh, we had an idea of mobile response. Uh, and a lot of those ideas about what mobile response was had to do, usually involved things like law enforcement or first responders, because that tends to be what you hear about in regards to mobile response uh, in the news, in, in, uh, in, in literature. And, uh, but we knew that we needed to know more. And so we were uh, fortunate enough to access technical assistance from uh, the University of Maryland through, through Liz Manley here, Rutgers University, and spent a lot of time uh, uh, being educated on what is children's mobile response. And the biggest uh, sort of light bulb that I think turned on for us is just how different, not just different, but just how different an adult mobile response model and approach is from a children's mobile, uh, mobile response uh, 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 model. And, and, and some of the things that come to mind about those differences is the idea in the adult world of being able to, or, or attempting to deescalate um, uh, at the access point through the phone call, right? But with the children's approach, understanding that it's probably not just the child is having the crisis, but it's probably the family having the crisis as well understanding that they're the ones who should define what that is, they're telling us that it is, and therefore we should acknowledge it in response to it. You launch a team rather than trying to uh, uh, to, to, to de-escalate, right? So there's a lot of differences uh, between the adult model and the children's model, but it, it, they are different and should and it should be treated uh, uh, as, uh, as different uh, as well. And so uh, through a lot of the technical assistance that, uh, that we received, we were able to define some of, of the elements that we wanted to be foundational in the model that we were developing for a children's MRSS here in New Mexico. One of those elements is having a single point of access. Uh, 988 was, uh, I think, a big influence in this. 988 started in summer of this year, as you all know, and that's more or less when we were having these discussions, and it was very timely. But it was really clear that there has to be... Um, a single point access because you want to standardize processes as much as you can. And you want to standardize this process from the point to when somebody picks up the phone call and says, how can we help? And the uh, triage that happens at that, not the escalation, but triaging through to assess for safety, gather information, um, it should be as standardized as possible. So, so we, we know that there had to be a single point of access and a single process that is going to um, uh, um, guide that um, that first access for families into uh, uh, children's MRSS response team. We looked at a lot of different models. We looked at a lot of different states to understand the composition of the response team, right? And and uh, and we landed in our response team uh, being a, a minimum of a two person response team that would include a, a peer support. Uh, it could be a clinician. A clinician could be involved at some point in the process as, uh, um, as well. But we're looking at, at least to a two-member uh, response team. And we also understood that um, crisis situations don't just sort of end because we signed the uh, safety plan. Um, they may continue and there may be some deeper things that need to be get addressed. So there should be a uh, stabilization period, um, some period of intensive care coordination. Um, and in New Mexico, we're looking at it at eight week stabilization period if it's needed for uh, for families. And uh, why re recreate the wheel right when there are some evidence tools, uh, some great evidence tools that could help us in this process. So New Mexico, 
is looking into using um, uh, the uh, Pray Foundation's CAP, the Crisis Assessment Tool, uh, the CAMS, the Children's uh, um, uh, Children and Adolescents um, Needs and Strengths Assessment Tools, as well as as, as other well accepted tools uh, in in our process, uh, and it, through sort of our evolution going from pre-planning to, to planning, we've also gotten some technical assistance in starting to really have already developed a training curriculum, defining the uh, training, the type of trainings, uh, length of trainings that a uh, mobile response team uh, should have that would lead to certification. Before we go to the next slide, uh, Jerry, is there anything you'd like to add? Sorry. Uh, yeah, um, I think that um, we're also working on the implementation manual. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, with New Jersey's help, we know what to include in that. And so we we are definitely right in the middle of shifting from pre-planning to uh, a really strong action-oriented planning phase. And we're actually changing the structure of how um, we're set up in New Mexico to accommodate that new action phase by adding a steering committee to our um, you know, structure to develop the planning process. That's right, thank you, Jerry. Can we go to the next slide, please? We're, uh, I'm gonna say that our, 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 our model right now is in, flux, it is in development, right? But there are definitely some things that, that we know that uh, as, a, as a service, um, it will have here in, in New Mexico. And uh, we know that the service MRSS itself has to be able to do that immediate response. Um, Lisa had talked about this uh, earlier. When a family calls, they want to know that there's going to be a response to their call. They want to know that someone's going to match the urgency with which they're picked up the phone to uh, to, to ask for help. So um, our model is going to provide that immediate response and that intervention to be able to de-escalate what the family defined as a crisis. We also know this is in you know, a basic systems theory, right? That if the young person, if the child is having some crisis situation, is affecting the caregiver, is affecting anybody uh, in, in, in the household and vice versa as well. So our approach is not, even though it is children's mobile response stabilization service, it is really a um, family approach where we are looking to understand the crisis related, uh, how, it, how it affects, how it's related to everyone in the family in as much as possible, be able to not only uh, de-escalate, but be able to do some safety planning, some family safety planning rather than individual uh, safety planning. And we know that's important. We know that uh, from, from a lot of research that's been done out there, um, a mole response service uh, tends to be the first service that families uh, experience in the behavioral health uh, field. Uh, it's their entry into into the field, if uh, if you will. So there is a lot of intentionality and strategy in having a good service because if you can provide a good service and not only provide the engagement, the escalation, but also uh, the planning, maybe some stabilization, that can have a direct consequence in other services being needed, including Christ, including um, out-of-home services, residential uh, treatment, foster care, and other systems uh, uh, getting involved, more intrusive systems. Um, some of the things that, that we are also keeping as best practices and, 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 and again, sort of making an elemental in, in, our, in, our, uh, in our model, um, the family defines uh, what, the crisis, uh, what the crisis is, right? Um, um, it is something that's delivered in the community. So it's not the escalated uh, 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 on the phone. And our goal is to get there within 60 minutes. We have talked about maybe uh, uh, 90 minutes, but we wanna get there as soon as you can. Uh, we'll talk in a minute about some of the um, geographic uh, rural challenges that we have in New Mexico uh, to be able to meet that goal. But uh, we're also intended intended to have those things be available to the same family uh, up to forty eight hours, uh, in case those crises kind of blow up. Uh, yeah, again, right? We know that um, uh, crises originate in communities, 
So community responders um, uh, that are trained are really best suited to address those situations. Um, New Mexico, we're very rural. We're over 121,000 square miles. And we are very different at a state where you go. For example, let, let me give you a quick example. One of my passions is food. And in New Mexico, Mexican food means very different where you are in the state. If you go to Northern New Mexico, it's not Mexican food, it's New Mexican food. If you go to Southern New Mexico, it's Mexican food, but don't call it New Mexican food because people will, will, uh, will be offended. If you go to Southeast New Mexico, you're talking about Tex-Mex food. And so you can just get the idea that we're so diverse uh, that it really leads to this point that community providers at a community should be attending to those crisis situations uh, for their communities because they understand each other. They know their communities, right? So we're very much being intentional about developing uh, the service through providers at local communities. Um, in New Mexico, we also have 23 um, server, tribal sovereign nations, Native American uh, nations. So we're also taking that into consideration as we're developing uh, uh, this model. And um, we are providing also uh, intensive care coordination through stabilization service for up to eight weeks if, 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 it's, if it's required and if it's needed. And this has been said several times, and I am going to emphasize that in New Mexico, we also have come to not only believe it, but also seeing the evidence through practice that peer support is very instrumental in this process. There is definitely a power when someone can truly not just empathize, but sympathize by saying, I was in your shoes so many years ago. I, I went through the exact same thing as you did. Jerry, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to emphasize on this slide. Yes, and, and I'm glad you kind of um, talked about peer support being so critical to this process because um, blending the, um, the practice with uh, peer support practice is, is going to be essential to the way we develop this. And um, so what Grace had alluded to before about let, let's build, you know, let's assess where we're at and build from there. New Mexico has a really strong uh, peer support uh, workforce. Um, we're building out the family peer support part of that workforce. Um, and it's essential and critical to uh, service delivery, especially in our rural and frontier areas. And so that's something that we're going to build on. Um, uh, and we're also going to look at how blending peer support services with clinical services um, looks, how that looks, and what's best practice around that. And I think that Hazel, Hazelin talked about that as well, how important it is, where do peers work best in that process, and how do we respect their um, their expertise in that process? So uh, thank you very much for lifting that up. Good emphasis. Thank you, Jerry. Can we go to the next slide, please? So this is New Mexico. Um, um, we are in the uh, in the Southwest. We're right in between Texas and Arizona. Uh, Colorado bordered us up to the north, and Mexico bordered us uh, down uh, on the south. We're 121,697 square miles. We're the uh, fifth largest state in the United States. That basically means that we can fit 44 other states in New Mexico and some multiple, multiple times. Uh, so we're a large state, but you can also see that our population is actually not very big at a little bit or over 2 million, right? Um, you can see that there's some population centers in, in, in central New Mexico, uh, northwest New Mexico and southern New Mexico. The great majority of our counties have some sparse uh, populations. They have some sparse populations, which also means they have some sparse um, service providers, which is one of the challenges as well that, that we're facing here in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in New Mexico. And you can also understand that um, it, we have a challenge that we're working on in addressing 
and being able to reach families within 60 minutes to, to 90 minutes. We have some plans, we have some strategies over that, but the geography of New Mexico definitely makes that a challenge. On the right, uh, the uh, color sections there, those are our uh, sovereign uh, Native American tribal nations here in New Mexico. I said earlier, there's 23 uh, of them. Uh, they are sovereign nations. So we are um, also uh, working in being able to partner with them to provide uh, children's mobile response in within their with their own sovereign lines. Jerry, anything you wanted to add to that? And again, with uh, working with the sovereign nations, um, you know, we we definitely have um, uh, we have to include them from the very start of the planning process, and um, when we do that, um, in order for us to serve serve them well, we have to understand what they need, and um, in workforce development, we that that workforce has to be hired within their nations. And um, there's always a little bit of, you know, contracting and and uh, MOUs and uh, agreements that we need to work through. And so it's very, very important to give that process the, the time it needs to be able to play out in and not be rushed so that uh, the tribal nation's sovereignty is is acknowledged and um, that, that we develop a strong partnership because they do know what's best for the people they serve. Thank you, Jerry. And um, Arne, can we go to the next slide, please? And Jerry, would you talk about uh, our, our funding structure? Yes, yeah, so um, we, we are, of course, developing our structures. We move along, we're just shifting it now to, um, accommodate the new uh new shift in in plan the planning process and sometimes you have to do that so when you're when you're setting up a planning structure there are stages to that structure as well and so we're ready for the new step and we're really excited about being ready for the the new phase in uh redevelopment of the structure and uh the the actual planning process to for phased implementation of uh, children's mobile response and stabilization here. Uh, children, the Children, Youth and Families Department is the, um, uh, the behavioral health authority for children in New Mexico. And so of course we are the leads. I am embedded in the behavioral health services division as is Arturo. And um, we work in partnerships with the human services department, which um, encompasses the medical assistance division or MAD. Um, and we're doing that. We have that very strong relationship for two reasons. Um, and, and the major reason is of course, Medicaid. We do want to fund this service through Medicaid. And uh, so we're doing a lot of great development work and have been for well over a year. And we also are working with the human services department because there's a rate that exists for adult teams already. And they have rolled out um, those adult teams in, in multiple parts of the state and they've been up and running for a couple of years. And uh, so they're gonna expand that. But in, in the meantime, um, you know, they're gonna you know, increase the rate. And so we have to work in alignment with them as that larger piece rolls out with them. And so that's a, another layer of planning and partnership that New Mexico is working through as well. Um, we do have, um, we're, we, we're going to have a hub and dandelion structure. So I'm sure everybody's like, why is there a dandelion <laughs> blowing in the wind on the top of this slide? And it's because, um, because of our, to overcome the challenges of our state, the diversity of the population, as well as the rural frontier and urban um, uh, parts of our state, we do have to think differently about service delivery. And we do have a, a, an extra special focus in New Mexico in reaching um, uh, historically unserved and underserved populations. And so um, as a result of colonization and inequitable practice in the past, 
um, we we have um, a, a lot of populations that are in that kind of um, genre, and we want to make sure that we hold them up as we move through this planning process. And so uh, we're looking at developing five to six hubs, which would be an agency that actually um, is able to provide 24-7 coverage, and they could encompass both an adult team and a children's mobile response and stabilization team. And um, right now, I think the hubs will mostly include adult teams, but um, then there will be a dandelion structure where those hubs will also support, and hence the, the little seeds flying off into the wind, but um, those, those hubs will support the um, development of like satellite programs in rural and frontier areas, and uh, you know, we, and and when we say frontier, we we do mean <laughs> frontier, and so that uh, that type of service delivery to those historically underserved and unserved populations it is going to happen um, with that careful planning. Uh, we we're looking um, to develop a really strong data collection and analysis and quality assurance support system. We have two state universities helping us to do that. Um, the University of New Mexico has already developed uh, quite a great system for our high fidelity wraparound. And we are so lucky to have Arturo and the team um, here that uh, develop the high fidelity wraparound because as Liz had mentioned earlier, we are kind of following suit um, in, in how we develop the children's mobile response and stabilization. Um, and then um, our certification process, we are exploring it right now with our credentialing board, but I can tell you that within those hubs, um, those hubs are most likely going to have an adult a mobile crisis team within their um, hub, but they will also have, they, they will have to certify before they bring on that children's mobile response because it is such a di different service. So um, that is kind of our, our uh, funding and quality assurance structure in a nutshell. So, so thank you. Thank you for all of this information. I'm gonna pull these slides down so that we can uh, get to some of the questions that have come up in the in the chat, which I think are really important questions for us to try and get to. One of them, I think you've already started to answer, and that is for or Torah and for uh, Jerry. There's a question about you know what are the geographical challenges. So uh, first of all, I love the uh, you know the the uh, example, and I can see it the difference in the in the Mexican food across the state at first you made me kind of hungry so it was pretty pretty good example but i think um it it goes to show what the challenges are when we begin to think about how do you implement a face-to-face -face intervention for children across a state that has some real geographical challenges as well as some um uh you know the geographical challenges plus some of the challenges around uh, population, right, serve. So you have a lot of space and not a lot of people. And I, just to give you an example, there's 2 million children alone in New Jersey, right? So you have 2 million people across a vast uh, amount of land. But what the reason I wanted you to be here today is to talk about how you're thinking about that, right? How that goes into every part of your thinking as you're, you're saying, hey, we think we can do this and that mobile response as it's designed is really important. And so we're gonna overcome those geographic challenges, right? By thinking about the, the hub and the dandelion model, beginning to think about what other resources are already available. How do we tap into some of the other folks who are out there, how do we build the workforce? So I was wondering if I could just have you uh, just outline some of those strategies one more time for folks who can um, you know, hear the, the real detailed work that's going into your implementation.
So I can give you um, a, a few more strategies that they were using, and then I'll, I'll defer to Jerry to break down the uh, um, how the underlying uh, 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 concept. Um, um, one of the things that we're working very closely is uh, the Children's Youth and Families Department um, um, are, has been very intentional about working with our uh, tribal communities, with our sovereign nations, so much so that we actually have on staff tribal liaisons. And so um, the communication has started and I know Jerry is actually working really hard in integrating them as part in, into our um, steering uh, committee. But we, we want them to be part of the conversation early on mm -hmm. uh, because they can have, probably have some good answers, good ideas. One of the things too, that in building um, our implementation approach, Jerry mentioned that we have an implementation manual uh, put together. I mentioned that we have built our um, training curriculum already. We didn't do that in a silo. We actually invited uh, provider sites from across the state that were part of the systems of care to come and help us to do that. And we posed those questions to us and they gave us uh, you know, some ideas. And as that group's growing into the steering group, we're pulling also other state agencies, other community partners and peer supports and youth and families to also help us answer those questions. Um, Jerry, do you want to talk more about uh, the funding structure? Um, I just want to say that when when we're working on the rate, it's it was really important for us to make sure that um, the rate was enough to incentivize the growth and expansion of this uh, across the state. Because so often these rates, um, New Mexico has had to kind of duct tape it's it's uh, statewide expansions together and and that's very difficult for the populations we serve and we don't get to um, serve the folks that are underserved and unserved it just continues to contribute to the problem so uh, I'm, I'm really happy with the way um, our state and our partners and our partnership with uh, human services department um, has has uh, really helped to uh, make that rate or uh, a potential for incentivizing the expansion. So, so what you what you're doing right in New Mexico? First of all, um, let me just make sure that we put some mold points to this. Right, one is you're really thoughtful about your implementation. Right, you're thoughtful about what you want to do, how you want to do it. The, you you have a system of care expansion grant with a focus on pilot counties that. We'll gather more information. You've been thoughtful about bringing providers to the table. You've been really thoughtful about the rate setting and, and the how Medicaid will play a role and that th those rates will take into consideration other things. One other bullet point that you haven't spoken about but I think is important uh, for folks to know is you also have other resources or thoughts about who's already on the ground, right? Who's already in the communities that um, that can be partners, and what is the future of the work in in New Mexico? Um, like the idea that you're really investing in the community, uh, the CCBHTs, right? Um, the the certified community behavioral health centers, right? Which is uh, an, an initiative uh, through SAMHSA that's really helpful when. Uh, you're thinking about how do you address some of these um, real geographical challenges, right? So not only the CCBHGs, but how do you really think about what's available in this community and this community? And you've really taken that map and paid attention to that. And then, so I just wanted to highlight those points for folks so that they could hear some of the real thoughtfulness and implementation and why it was important to include New Mexico in this conversation even though you're early in implementation, all the thoughtfulness that goes into it. There was another question in the chat that I wanted to get to, and that is, how do you connect the dot between mobile response and stabilization and intensive care coordination? And how are you thinking about that as you're thinking about implementation? Since wraparound has already been you know, in existence in New Mexico, and you've done a lot of really important work around that. So, Maybe you can take a, a shot at answering that one for folks. I would love to, Liz. Um, if you 
I think there's there's some some key some key differences with um, stabilization services. You are looking at short term stabilization, uh, short term, right? So you're looking at, at, at a limited period. The idea of um, stabilization uh, is underscored with the premise that there are needs that are driving this constant um, need for crisis intervention. And so short-term civilization is going to look into what are those needs um, to some to some extent somewhat concrete and, ident and then identify um, services and supports that can come alongside the family. Now that's the other part of intensive coordination to be able to do a teaming process, right? Bring people to the table, not only the ones that maybe the family may already be working with, but ones that are new to the family that are going to help to meet those, uh, uh, those needs. Plug in the services and supports, highlight the strengths that the youth, the family already have to make sure that that's part of the planning process and or the coordination and of the communication uh, short term with the idea that you can do a, a, a soft step away after the uh, eight weeks and those services and supports can continue to do the work. Now, one of the things we're also planning to use is the cancer children's uh, adolescents needs and strengths assessments in our process. We have built a decision support model, um, i.e. an algorithm into it, to be able to identify that when the needs are really extensive and complex, mm -hmm. it does recommend uh, a potential referral to wraparound. That's probably gonna be one of our key indicators where the family actually needs more support, more intensive long-term support that wraparound can actually uh, do. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a, a comment in the, in the chat that I want to address. Um, and Grace, then I have a question for you, so you're going to be up in a sec. But let me just uh, put it out there that there's a comment in the chat that um, asks the question, without the other supports in the service array, not enough intensive inhale, respite, all of the other things, how does mobile response and stabilization get rolled out statewide in New Mexico um, and what will that look like, right, for folks? And um, and I just want to preference this uh, before you even jump in to say this is the challenge that most states have, right? This is not a unique New Mexico challenge, and that New Jersey, who implemented uh, this, and I think Ohio as an example, and we're going to give Grace a second to talk about this as well is um, in some ways you have to do things uh, uh, simultaneously. Sometimes you have to actually uh, do things first. The role of mobile response and stabilization in setting the stage around early assessment, around stabilization services within the home, the use of community connections for young people actually defers the, the need for some of those more intensive clinical services quickly, right? So, and let me just say this one more time, right? That because mobile response and stabilization has the opportunity to get there when parent is beginning to see that things are challenging, there's ways to be able to help that family in the, in, in the early phases of the crisis. It is still a crisis that doesn't require, in fact, we would argue in the sequencing of the work, formal interventions are not going to be helpful right? Because the young person isn't ready for them. And because we're going to sequence these formal interventions more effectively and impactfully, then we actually need less of them. It doesn't mean we don't need them. And it doesn't mean that the intensive in-home services are not going to be an issue for the mobile response teams. And that, won't, that there won't be added pressure on the intensive care coordination and high fidelity wraparound teams. But it's important to know that these are part of the implementation, implementation strategies that uh, states are struggling with across the country. So I just wanted to say that. I also wanted to say that um, I think uh, New Mexico team is really working hard to try and figure all this out. So I want to give you a second to address that. And then Grace, we're going to hit you sort of with the same question since uh, Ohio Rise is sort of moving in the same direction a little bit ahead of New Mexico. So go ahead, guys. I think uh, one of the uh, examples of uh, what happens in New Mexico that folks are really concerned about, and for good reason, um, is that uh, there's a six to eight week 
um, wait to get into mental health services here, behavioral health services. And so, you know, it, but like you said, it, it is not a reason to stop. It's actually a reason to go forward with children's mobile response and stabilization because those eight weeks that we can be there, it's <laughs> most families aren't going to resolve their problems in eight weeks. Mm -hmm. However, there is a space for um, our team to help support those families um, if they need other services that have weights or um, maybe find some other solutions. Uh, there's, there's some grassroots solutions popping up all over New Mexico as well that don't involve the formal behavioral health system. There's uh, family organizations or organizations that are, um, you know, really support families that, that don't have anything to do with the system, um, any of the systems, in, in a, but more informal community systems. Mm -hmm. um, that are truly community-based and may be developed by an uncle or, or maybe <laughs> that person, they call them uncle and they're not, but they are in, in their life and everybody knows they could go here. Um, and they've been there for a long time. So, so, uh, those are the types of things that we have to lift up. And they're also very responsive to the cultural needs of the families and the communities, um, that we're serving. So, so uh, yeah, I think um, children's mobile response and stabilization can be developed with all of that in mind in New Mexico. I, I think you're absolutely right. And I just want to say you got a little love in the chat by uh, Sherry, who's saying that it, it's a, it can be a complete intervention as well, right? And so that's the other important part. I know that we're, we're getting ready to run out of time. Grace, I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about how that sequencing and rollout in, in Ohio has really been powerful. And because this question was the same in Ohio, right? It's yes. like, how are you gonna do this when we don't have any of this stuff, right? So how, how are you doing it, Grace? Because you're, you're, you guys are rocking and rolling in Ohio. So how's yeah, that? Thank you, Liz. So as you've been following our stories, <laughs> um, Ohio had a fort uh, fortunate opportunity to be able to start with our pilot. And so when we use our system of care opportunity, which uh, New Mexico is also doing right now, we're able to establish that pilot. And so we're able to establish some foundation, uh, create change teams uh, that really got passionate about this work once they understood what we were doing uh, mm -hmm. for children uh, behavioral health. And so we had those allies. And, and as we began to talk about going statewide, those allies were also at the table talking about how this can make a difference for children. And so it was not just those who were doing it mm -hmm. uh, or just in the Children's Bureau, but we had allies. We had the board directors talking about this service. Uh, we have providers talking about this service. And so as the uh, governance were, do, uh, uh, were being formed, the Council for Ohio Rise, people were talking about this service as well. Mm -hmm. And so there were transparency for Ohio as well, but we're creating the rules. Uh, because we have already established some foundation from what we have learned from our pilot programs. And so we're able to bring some of that uh, to the table. We invite people to talk about that and, and give us some ideas on what will work and what, we, what won't work as well. Yeah, it's, a, it's an excellent point, right? Like this is a, a, a world in which we require ongoing feedback about how it's going. We need champions who are going to both champ, you know, be champions for the work, do advocacy around financing, understand how the practices work, pay attention to the gaps and, and, and the challenges, right? And so um, it's important that we're paying attention at all of these steps, but you have to start somewhere. And if you're gonna start anywhere in systems transformation, mobile response and stabilization is a really powerful one because its goal is to really help parents learn when and how to ask for help so that you're providing that intervention at a time when it's gonna be most valuable and most used. The other thing that I think it's really important for folks to pay attention to in this conversation is you'll hear that there's more resources coming in because Medicaid has been a partner in the work, right? And so these additional resources allow us to divert other dollars that are being spent in systems into the use of intensive in-home services and those other 
supports that are going to be necessary, in particular for children who have both moderate and complex needs, right? So there's ways in which mobile redirects and re um, the service delivery system in itself. So it's just really important for us to, to get all of that. Listen, I, I want to just give um, Hazel in a minute uh, to sort of wrap things up. I know there are some questions in the chat we didn't get to today. Uh, if you have further questions, you're more than welcome to reach out to me. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. But Hazel, if you want to just take one minute to wrap us up, that'd be terrific. One minute. Thank you. I just think the today's discussion has been very rich and enlightening. I'm very happy to see the role of uh, the importance of peer support being recognized and integrated in the work that's being done in both New Mexico and uh, Ohio. And final comment I would say is that, you know, youth and families have such a wealth of experience that can be leveraged to bring stability and success to families that it's important for us to just always keep their voices central in all conversations. So happy to see that. And kudos to you all for the work that you're doing. We appreciate you. And I wanna thank, uh, both uh, the folks from New Mexico and from Ohio for joining us today. It's not easy to talk about implementation when you're in the middle of it mm -hmm. and to think that you have to sort of think through how to actually present in a way that can be helpful. And these guys have done a really good job of helping us understand both the challenges and opportunities in the, in the work you're doing in two very different states, two different uh, rollouts, but with the same intention of being upfront. Um, and available for families 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days, face to face in the community. And, and we wanna actually champion their work whenever we can to help them achieve those goals. So I wanna thank them. I wanna thank all of you for joining us today. I hope to see you next month when uh, Christopher Balanci joins me for a conversation. So it's really been an honor and a privilege and we uh, hope to see you guys soon. Take care. Thank you. Thank you for joining this month's Mobile Response and Stabilization Services Learning Community Session. Please take a few moments to complete the evaluation for this session using the following link being posted in the chat. We will be providing a certificate of attendance after completion of each session being offered throughout the entire series. So make sure that you are registered with the same name logged into each session so that we can confirm your attendance and the total time you were a part of this session. Please allow up to 10 business days for your certificate of attendance to become available in Ideas at the Institute. Any presentations, resources, and recordings will be made available to you within Ideas at the Institute. Once you are registered for the learning community, you will have access to all of the upcoming and previously recorded sessions. We hope you join us again for next month's session. You can access the Zoom link for each session and download a calendar appointment for that session by logging into Ideas at the Institute access the MRSS Learning Community Curriculum and click the View button for that upcoming session. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to seeing you at the next Learning Community session.